but yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful, uh, you know, event. I really wish I could be there in person, of course, um, because if I were there in, in person, I could uh, look everyone in the eye and I could ask you this, in, this very important question. What's at the other end of a black hole? My friend Melody asked me this question when I was eight years old. I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy, but this time I had no idea what to say. The question was scary. I grew up in Southern Utah in the Western part of the United States. And this is the home of red rocks, hot, dry summer nights and clear skies. And these are perfect conditions for stargazing. And as a kid, Melody and I would often bicycle out of town to get away from the lights of the city. And we would stare up at the stars and we would ask each other questions about the universe. How big is the earth? What's the sun made of? Why do galaxies spin around? How far away is the edge of the universe? What's inside a black hole? When she asked me that one, I stopped and I paused and I thought about it. I finally said, I don't know. And Melody said, some of my ancestors thought that the first people came out of a hole in the ground that opened up after a big rainstorm. Maybe there are like aliens inside of a black hole. And we stared up at the vast dark cosmos. Yeah, but a black hole is a place where there's so much gravity that everything that goes in gets totally crushed, I said. Black holes can suck in entire stars sometimes. I, I don't think aliens could be in there and still be alive. Melody was an indigenous Native American from a local tribe. I don't remember if she was Paiute or Navajo, and the kids at school would sometimes make fun of Melody, calling her nasty names. She didn't like tests, she didn't like homework assignments, but she ran circles around the other kids in classroom discussions with the teacher. And there was a reason she and I were friends because she was never afraid to ask the big questions. And when she finally asked, what's at the other end of a black hole? The question caught me off guard. Well, nothing. I said, a black hole is like a huge trash compactor or like a really strong drain, like a bathtub drain, but in space where if something gets too close, it gets sucked in forever and crushed completely. And Melody said, yeah, but when my mom's wedding ring fell in the bathtub drain, it wasn't lost forever. The plumber found it in a pipe under the dirt outside. We stared up at the stars, sparkling like jewels. And finally I said, well, I, I don't know what's at the other end of a black hole, but I, I know for sure that if I fell into one, I I'd definitely try to crawl out. And Melody said, but you couldn't. Nothing can crawl out of a black hole. And we were silent for a long time. And finally I said, wow, a black hole sounds terrible and really lonely. And even though there was really no danger of eight-year-old me falling into a black hole, the fact that black holes exist is a terrifying prospect. An enormous cosmic vortex sucking in entire stars and crushing them into oblivion. Why do black holes exist? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we go too much further, we need to answer one very important question. What is a black hole really? If you're watching this from home, chances are you're sitting on a chair or a sofa or standing at a table or something. No matter where you are, no matter your gender or your skin color, you all have one very important thing in common. You're not currently floating around your room. Why are you not floating? Because of gravity, of course. Gravity is the force of attraction between any two big objects like the sun and the earth or between the earth and you. But gravity is not just any old force. Gravity does what it does because the presence of a large amount of stuff within a certain volume of space bends the fabric of space-time itself, causing one thing to fall into this bent space-time toward the other thing. A ship traveling through space is like a marble rolling along a rubber sheet. The marble always travels in a straight line from its own perspective, but if we put a bowling ball on the sheet, 
From an external perspective, the straight line path of the marble is bent as the marble falls toward the bowling ball. And now gold is about 14 times denser than a bowling ball. So if we put a bowling ball sized chunk of gold there instead, the marble's path is bent even more severely. And if we finally put something so incredibly dense there, the bending would be so great that if it gets too close, the marble would never be able to get out. And your spaceship, no matter how ferociously you fired its rockets, could not escape. And in space, these are things like the sun, the neutron star, and then a black hole. And this, the one where you have so much density that it creates such a, such a gigantic sink in space-time is a black hole. The center of a black hole is a mystery, but according to the mathematics of gravity, there should be a huge amount of stuff packed in a one-dimensional point of infinitely small volume and of infinitely curved space-time. This is a singularity, and it's the place where the known laws of physics become meaningless. And a black hole is called black for a very good reason. Not only would it be impossible for you in your rocket ship to blast away from the center of a black hole once you pass the point of no return, the event horizon, black holes bend space-time so radically that not even light, which travels at the fastest possible speed in our universe, can escape. Black holes are empty, dark voids in space that completely suck in anything that gets too close to them, and they're all over the universe. But wait a minute. This is an artist's representation. If black holes are completely dark, how do we know they exist? Because we see dark spots in the night sky where stars seem to be orbiting around nothing. The star symbol in the middle of this animation is a completely black spot on the night sky. Obviously, something is there. Additionally, a black hole should create a distinct pattern of radio waves emitted from the hot bent gas around it, which, as you know, was detected by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration just last year for a black hole in the galaxy M87, 55 million light years away. We literally can't see a black hole, but we can infer that black holes exist just as predicted by the mathematics of our best description of gravity called general relativity. But how do black holes come into existence? I mean, this is all well and good, but how does the universe make something so dense that it nearly punctures the fabric of space-time? One way is when an enormous star dies. After billions of years, a star can exhaust the fuel it needs to burn, and with no nuclear fusion to push it outward, grab, whoops, no nuclear fusion to push it outward, one moment here, With no nuclear fusion to push it outward, gravity wins. Technical difficulty here, one moment. There we go. And here we go, yes, okay. After billions of years, the star can exhaust the fuel it needs to burn, and with no nuclear fusion to push it outward, gravity wins, and the star collapses in on itself. And this collapse can be so severe that it creates a black hole. So could you make a black hole yourself? Maybe you think you're very strong in your, in, your, in your living room there. You could pack some peanut butter into a very, very small amount of space. If you want to know the density needed to create a black hole, just pull out your textbook on gravity. I assume you all have a textbook on gravity by your bedside table, like I do, and you find the black hole equation. It'll tell you for some given amount of mass, the size of the volume you need to pack it in to create a black hole, determined by something called the Schwarzschild radius. For example, to make a black hole out of the Earth, you'd need to pack the entirety of its mass into a sphere a little bigger than one centimeter across. Most black holes that we know of are much bigger than this. In the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way sits a black hole with a diameter about one third of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, but with a mass four million times that of the Sun.
but with a mass one, four million times that of the sun. But there are much bigger black holes than that in other galaxies, with masses tens of billions of times that of the sun, packed into volumes much larger than our solar system. In fact, such as the one at the middle of M87. So are big black holes the only kind? If what I said is true, that a black hole happens when you take a given amount of mass and compress it into a certain size, can there be smaller black holes? In principle, yes. A few years ago, some astronomers suggested the existence of a ninth planet in our solar system, helpfully named Planet Nine, with an orbit far bigger than that of Neptune to explain the unexpected behavior of some objects far, far away from the sun. The problem, detailed studies have observed precisely zero Planet Nines. But what if Planet Nine is actually a black hole about the size of an apple but with a mass five times that of the Earth. Such a small black hole could have been created in the ultra hot and dense conditions just after the bang and had been floating around in the universe for billions of years to finally become stuck in our solar system. This is all conjecture at this point, but if planet nine exists and if it's actually an apple-sized primordial black hole, it could provide us with a possible way to study a black hole up close because black holes aren't just fascinating curiosities that we can wonder about here on earth. Black holes could be the best way we could ever hope to shed light on one of the most puzzling and frustrating mysteries of science. In physics, we have two fantastically good theoretical models that have withstood essentially all of our experimental tests. One is called general relativity, which describes how gravity works on very large scales. The other is called quantum mechanics, which governs the world of the small. And each of these by itself ranks among the most impressive intellectual achievements of humankind. But there's a problem. They can't both be right, as currently understood. When we put these two separate theories together, everything breaks. We get nonsense answers like infinite energies or probabilities greater than one. When this happens, this is the universe's way of telling us to look closer. And the place where these two theories collide in nature is a black hole. When you take a huge amount of mass, billions of times the mass of the sun, and try to compress it into a singularity, a one-dimensional point of zero volume and infinite density, you have to use both general relativity and quantum mechanics. If we knew what happens inside of a black hole, we could solve one of the most baffling mysteries of science. But how? Most physicists aren't convinced that planet nine, if it exists, is a black hole. And we won't be able to travel to any nearby large black holes anytime soon, maybe for hundreds of years, if ever. The nearest one is more than a thousand light years away. And worse, even if we traveled to a black hole, and even if some brave scientist dove in to study it from the inside, it would be physically impossible for her to send what she learned back out to the rest of us. It seems hopeless. How could we, stuck here on Earth, ever hope to study a situation where we take a large amount of energy and mass and forcefully pack it into a small volume. Well, my colleagues and I create conditions like this all the time at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, buried about 100 meters underground. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets colder than outer space to accelerate protons, you're made of protons, to almost the speed of light. And we slam them into each other millions of times a second, briefly recreating the conditions of the universe as they were a fraction of a second after the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, collecting a record of the debris of these collisions to search for evidence of undiscovered particles that could help us answer the biggest open questions in science. And it's entirely possible that one of the reasons we don't understand how gravity and quantum mechanics work together is because we're not looking at the fabric of space-time in the right way. Everything I've said about black holes so far assumes that there are only three dimensions of space. But what if there are additional dimensions of space that are tiny 
curled up circles at every point in the universe and that are imperceptible to you and me. If this were true, it could immediately explain why gravity is so weak because you and I only experience a tiny three-dimensional slice of gravity, whereas the rest of gravity leaks into these other spatial dimensions. And it would make it much easier to create a miniature black hole at the Large Hadron Collider. Recall that we said, under the usual assumptions, to make a black hole, you need to take a certain amount of stuff, energy and mass, and, into a, and pack it into a given volume defined by the Schwarzschild radius. And when we collide two protons at the Large Hadron Collider, it's true that protons are very small, but we simply can't achieve high enough energies at CERN. We can't accelerate the protons to high enough speeds and energies to pack them into a small enough volume to make a standard black hole whole. It's just not going to happen. But if there are additional dimensions of space, then we would need to redefine what we mean by radius and volume. In a radius in three dimensions is not exactly the same as a radius in four, five, six, or more dimensions. Thus, if there are additional dimensions of space, it's indeed possible that we could potentially create a microscopic black hole when we, create, when we collide protons at the Large Hadron Collider. And these tiny black holes would briefly snap into existence, vibrate into extra dimensions, and then snap back into our world and decay in a 3D spectacular spray of particles that would hit our detectors with a particular pattern, which might look something like this in the detector Atlas, which is the one that I work on. Now, my colleagues and I have been colliding protons and taking data at the Large Hadron Collider for 10 years now. And so far, we see no evidence of these extra dimensions. No evidence so far of miniature black holes. Will miniature black holes show up at the Large Hadron Collider in the next 15 years of data taking? We don't know, but we'll never know unless we look. Will tiny black holes show up at the next generation of collider four times as long and seven times as energetic as the Large Hadron Collider? We'll never know unless we look. And will they show up at a collider stretching around the moon? We'll never know unless we look, but how high do we need to go? Whether or not there are additional dimensions of space, if we really want to do this right, if we really want to understand how black holes work, we would need to go big, really big. We would need to achieve something called the Planck energy in a collider. This is the energy at which gravity and quantum mechanics must have something to do with each other. If we were to collide particles at the Planck energy, everything would be revealed. We'd understand everything about gravity, quantum mechanics, dark matter, the Higgs boson, the nature of time, and yes, finally, black holes. But by some naive estimates, to reach the Planck energy, we'd need to build a particle collider <clears throat> that stretches around the outer orbit of Neptune at a minimum. <clears throat> Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. And by the time our civilization had advanced to the point where we could build such an experiment, it's likely we'll have advanced to be able to travel to a black hole and study it up close. So imagine yourself. 500 years from now, you're traveling to explore a black hole up close for the first time. One day you get tired. You know that you should arrive at your destination in about 6,000 years. So you decide to take a 6,000 year long nap. And after 6,000 years, you awake, have a cup of coffee and notice from your gravitational sensor that something is very wrong. You seem to be too close to the event horizon of your black hole destination. You peer out of the window and you see an enormous, profoundly black disk in space, the light from the stars and galaxies behind it, twisted and deformed. You stare into the center of this disk, a cosmic eye staring back at you and it's the emptiest thing you've ever seen. Your jaw drops and your eyes widen and you realize you're not sure if you've passed the event horizon, the point of no return, yet. You frantically double check your gravitational sensor to find out which direction points toward the biggest gravitational change, which would be the direction of the black hole's singularity. To find out which direction you would have to point your spaceship to fire the rockets at maximum speed in the opposite direction to escape. And you notice you're not quite 
at the event horizon. You have five seconds to blast away. You jump from your seat, leaping toward the controls for the rockets and spill your coffee all over your hands, burning your fingers. You scream and fall to the ground. And by the time you get up, it's too late. You're passing the event horizon, black hole. You nearly stop breathing. Your mouth is dry. Close your eyes. You can't believe this could possibly be happening. You open your eyes and you gaze out the window and everything looks about the same. The ominous black disc is getting a little larger, but otherwise nothing is different. You, you feel the same. You think may, maybe your time estimate was wrong. Maybe there's still a chance to escape. You triple check your gravitational sensor and it says that no matter which direction you point it, you are pointing toward the singularity of the black hole. In every direction this way, your path leads to the singularity. In the opposite direction, your path leads to the singularity. And then you know for sure you've passed the event horizon. You're inside a black hole. A calm terror settles over, over you. How did you get into this situation? Very slowly while you were asleep, the conditions of the universe around you were steadily changing. It was almost imperceptible at first. Your spaceship noted that some of the light in one direction seemed a bit different, a bit bent, but nothing extremely alarming. But then after a long period of things changing slightly slowly, Suddenly everything changed drastically and you realized that the world around you was very different. And floating in your spaceship inside the event horizon of a black hole, what do you do? You, you might start thinking of possible escapes. Even though you know intellectually there's, there's no way to travel back outside the event horizon, you took physics. You go through all of the options. Is, is there something you've missed? I mean, maybe. Maybe it's possible that all of the clever scientists were wrong and there's some unknown way to escape that you, you hadn't anticipated. You start daydreaming that if you're just lucky or if you just wait long enough, the situation will, will sort itself out and you may eventually pass over the event horizon again and could zoom away from the black hole back to the way things were, to the universe you previously knew. And as you're daydreaming, you look down and you notice that your feet are drifting away from you. Your legs are being stretched into long, thin, spaghetti-like tubes. And then suddenly, your shoes are so far away that you can't see them anymore. And in that split second before you reach the singularity, you realize two things. One, that no one really knows what happens in the middle of a black hole. And two, that there is literally no going back to the way things were before. The only way out, if there is a way out, is directly the black hole. What's at the other end of a black hole? No one knows. Some people think that when we understand how gravity and qu quantum mechanics work together, we'll see how there's no real singularity at the center of a black hole. And black holes just collect all the stuff they eat and then slowly radiate it away nearly imperceptibly. And after they run out of food, after billions or trillions of years of radiation, they will have finally exhaust everything and then evaporate in a blip. Still others think that black holes could be bridges to other points in space-time. If you look closely at the equations of general relativity, under certain conditions, you can create a black hole that can open up in one point of space and time, and then whatever goes in gets spit out in a completely different point far away in space and possibly far away in time, future or past. Current studies seem to suggest that these conditions may not exist in our universe, but of course research is ongoing. Still others think that black holes could be portals to another universe. Is it possible 
that our universe began 13.8 billion years ago as a black hole that opened up in a different universe. These ideas are captivating, but if you accidentally fell into a black hole, you likely wouldn't be thinking about them. You'd likely be panicking and thinking, how did this happen? Why do black holes even exist? But that's the wrong question. Asking why black holes exist is like asking why a pandemic that grinds society to a halt exists. The answer, it's because the background conditions were arranged in such a way to lead to the existence of such a thing. And if you understand the conditions, you will understand the catastrophe. Sometimes reality, for whatever reason, gets twisted beyond recognition, nearly to the point of delirium and madness. For black holes, the fabric of space-time itself is twisted beyond recognition. For society, in a moment like now, many people, daily life is, is an absurd cartoon compared to what it once was. COVID is killing our loved ones. Far-right politicians are gaining power, pushing fraudulent, racist, and misogynistic lies. And the climate crisis is nearly guaranteed to render our planet uninhabitable in a few decades. Society is a twisted, often incomprehensible catastrophe. We seem to be heading into the center of a societal black hole, but such catastrophes are also golden opportunities for new knowledge and for change for the better. For physics, if we were able to study a black hole up close, we would learn untold things about nature, about how quantum mechanics and general relativity relate, and about our human place in the universe. For society, the current moment is a golden opportunity to stop and think critically about the conditions that led to this moment, our voraciously extractive relationship to the environment that makes new viruses and pandemics more likely, our political and economic systems that have created and exacerbated the wealth inequality, racism, sexism, misogyny, deprivation of the global South, and unequally distributed opportunities many of us face daily, a system that has led to the fact that the richest people in the world in the middle of a public health and economic crisis, jobs vanishing, millions dying, regular people unable to pay their rents, black people rioting for the right to exist. The richest people are just getting richer and richer. We can't go back. This is the danger of a moment like this. Joe Biden won't fix US society. Centrist politicians across Europe, many of whom place their career prospects and business interests above the health and lives of human beings this year, won't fix European society. And when any of us says that they wish to go back to the way things were, well, that just means that we have neither recognized the severity of the situation nor have we confronted the fact that the way things were was not good. Before this pandemic, society was broken and it still is today. It's built on a fraudulent, exploitative system. The world is never returning to its former state. It's been unfathomably twisted, just like a black hole. But just as if you found yourself inside of a black hole, it does no good to wish you could go back outside of it. You physically could not. We should instead ask ourselves, What's at the other end of a black hole? Will we be crushed into oblivion or will we emerge on the other side with a new knowledge of the universe, new knowledge of the conditions that created the black hole, new and better way, knowledge of the way that the conditions of the society were arranged to lead to our current crisis situation? Will we emerge on the other side of the socio-political black hole to a new and better beginning? The only way we can do this is if we understand better what connects us. If you fell into a black hole, you'd be completely isolated and alone. Today, we're all in this catastrophe together. Society, politics, and economics are currently set up to encourage us as a collective to waste our time and distract us from realizing that if we were to cooperate, we would be stronger and could take back the wealth that has been allowed to accumulate into the hounds of a tiny number of people. For example, our current medical research landscape is set up to compel dozens of pharmaceutical companies to compete in secrecy. This means we have very bright scientists wasting their time working on the same drugs and treatments. If we had a different setup, would we already have a set of COVID treatments right now? If we recognize that what connects us, the desire to live in health and security is much stronger 
than what separates us. The entirety of society would improve. And in physics, under the current conditions, only a relatively small percentage of humans are born into the right situation to even be able to consider pursuing physics research. What voices and perspectives are we missing? What if the little girl who will eventually have the insight that connects gravity and quantum mechanics currently lives in a family who has no possibility of ever sending her to university? Can we, as a society, find the courage to center what connects us and fix those things that separate us for the good of science? This is also true in your life and work. In this unique catastrophic situation, are you taking the opportunity to figure out what better connects you to others in general or in your field? Collaborators, clients, customers, new positions, new markets, new jobs entirely, and new beginnings, or are you still secretly thinking about and hoping for a time when everything will return to normal? There is no going back, and we shouldn't want that. We owe it to the least privileged amongst us, those who aren't lucky enough to join such an excellent event like West Visions, to allow ourselves the bravery and courage of imagining a better way to construct society than the one that led to the current catastrophic situation. If we can't summon the courage to imagine and construct a better society, surely our society will be crushed into oblivion. Because when I see the government of the United States putting children in cages on the Mexico-US border, and when I see otherwise smart, smart people all over Europe being persuaded to vote for racist, misogynistic, white nationalist political parties, fooled by fraudulent imaginary narratives about migration, even in otherwise intelligent countries, and when I see how we've allowed decades of uncontrolled fossil fuel extraction to destroy Earth's climate, and we're not acting fast enough to fix it, and and when I think about my friend Melody and how when I was a kid, my classmates would mock and bully her because of the color of her skin and how this made it difficult for her to attend class and how she never went to high school. I feel angry, but it's not just regular anger. Oh, I feel regular anger too, but as a physicist, I feel an extra layer of anger because I see how when we allow these things to happen, we're betraying a cosmic truth that we are all parts of the same universe and we're all in this universe together. And so back on that red rock in Southern Utah, when I was a child, I said, wow, black hole sounds terrible, and really lonely. And we were silent for a very long time. And finally, Melody said, well, don't worry. If you fell into a black hole, I'd jump in after you. And I looked at her and I said, thanks, me too. And we gazed up at the night sky, the Milky Way swirling and twisting across the cosmos. Thanks. So thank you, James, for your inspiring talk. It's really fascinating what's going on into the universe. And as we have some questions from the audience, I think we can start with the Q&A. Um, can you hear us, James? Better. Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect, yes, yes it works. So here's one question from Thorsten. Uh, can there be a other side of a black hole? When a black hole is more like a globe or square, square, like in the white hole theory. Yeah, so that is a very profound question, and it's uh, the kind of detail that, of course, I can't really get into in a you know thirty-minute talk. But that's one idea as to what could be the sort of opposite side of a black hole. Because if a black hole is you know, defined as this volume of space that is so bent that anything that goes in has to keep going and there's no way to get out. And essentially, if you want a few more details when you get past this event horizon, in fact, the fabric of space itself is moving toward the black hole like at almost the speed of light, sometimes the speed of light. So it's like, there's no possibility. That's one of the reasons, one of the explanations is why you can never get out of a black hole once you reach this, uh, reach this um, point. Some people think that, okay, if that exists, in fact, 
there can be the other part of the other side of this. What if there's a point in space where nothing could ever uh, get close to it because the space itself is moving outward at the same speed that it would go into a black hole. And so this is a white hole. And some people think, okay, maybe there's some way that a black hole could lead to a white hole. That's entirely possible. But uh, again, we don't have any evidence that white holes exist. Um, they do pop out of the equations of general relativity if you look at them in just the right way. Um, but that, of course, is one idea. It's, it's related to this idea that you know, it's really hard to it's really hard for our brains to at first adjust to what it means to go inside someplace where the fabric of space time is so twisted that it, there's nothing can get out. Like the concept of the other side or the other end really does require us to, um, uh, you know, rethink what we mean in terms of concepts. And so that's one idea. So yes, we, the, the answer is that yes, there could be a white hole on the other side of a black hole. There could be white holes in our universe, but we don't, we haven't seen any of these. Um, and of course we've never been inside of a black hole to understand if that's what happens on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. I think, I hope this answers your question, Thorsten. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. So yeah, it was, it was hard to hear because I think you were far away from the microphone, but I think it's the notion that do black holes violate conservation of energy? So this is a long-standing debate in black hole physics. Um, the answer is that they probably don't because we've never seen any violations of conservation of energy anywhere in the universe ever um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a fundamental sense. Um, and anytime you see something like that, there's probably some explanation for it somewhere else. And so the current idea is that not necessarily they, do they violate energy conservation, but how do they not, how do they, how do they avoid violating energy conservation? One way that people, you know, that people think about is that because there's so much stuff going into a black hole and nothing ever gets out, the question is, where is it going? Okay, that's a good point. Some people like Stephen Hawking noticed that, in fact, if you look closely, uh, black holes, even though nothing, no, no light can be sent away from it or bounced off of it in the, the same sense that you can, you know, light can come away from a star. In fact, black holes should actually radiate. They should radiate uh, stuff away. It's, it's very, 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 very faint. And it's more, it's completely imperceptible to us so far away from many of the ones that we, you know, we see. But for in principle, if you would go up close to an event horizon of a black hole or around that area, you should see some radiation coming out. So some people think that this should be enough to make it so that you don't violate any known laws of physics. That, of course, is you know not to be demonstrated conclusively. Still, uh, no one's ever seen evidence of Hawking radiation so far. Um, but that's one idea. And there's some more complicated things about how it's a it's a much much more fascinating uh, idea that we also have to think about like, the notion like how does time come into this, right? Because even though space, we, it kind of we understand how space. You know, uh, it can be bent in a way it's like the, the, the analogy of the rubber sheet with the bowling ball, you know, you're bending space. But how do you bend time? What does that even mean? Right. Because time for us is very weird. It goes in one direction and we can't go backward in time space. We can go backward and forward in time. So once you get to this point where time starts to, you know, starts to shift around, it gets very weird. Some people think that if you were looking at your friend, imagine, you know, my little scenario, you're traveling to a black hole. Imagine there was another spaceship behind you was accompanying you and then watched you go into the event horizon, if they had a very precise enough device, what would they would actually see, even though you wouldn't feel anything going over the event horizon into the black hole, they would actually see you get burned to a crisp and your kind of like imprint would be stuck on the, the event horizon of the black hole forever, or maybe not forever, you know, longer than the age of the universe for it to radiate away. So that's, that. you know, it, it's still, it, it's, it, it's, it's the fact that it has, comes down to this notion that, you know, because the observer is so important in fundamental physics, one observer from far away from the black hole will see one thing. If you pass into the black hole, you will experience another reality. Both of those are completely valid because no one will ever be able to see both of them simultaneously or experience them simultaneously. So again, you then ask the question, what does that mean for your stuff? Like all the stuff that was in your body, does it actually get, you know, burned onto the event horizon of the black hole? And then it kind of just you know, kind of the, the, the ash kind of fl fluffs away. And, you know, maybe your friends could go collect the ash and go take it back so you could be you know, buried or something in a mausoleum, that this is an open question. And so we, we don't think that black holes violate energy conservation, but the exact way that they avoid violating is an interesting uh, ongoing topic of discussion. <laughs> yes, yeah. thank you very much for a detailed answer.
And yes, I think we have another one and it's from Chris and I just will read it out. I also wonder if it would be possible to take a picture of a black hole if no light is reflected at all. What it's a think? very, very good question. Yeah, so that gets <laughs> to the to that key, you know, because this quite this this image that I showed, right? You've got the big, you know, uh, the the kind of orange donut in space, right? This fantastic image from last year. That's not actually a photo of a black hole, and that's a very profound uh, observation by by Chris. Is that that's not a photo of a black hole because you literally cannot take a photo of a black hole. There's nothing coming away from a black hole, you know, photons that you can collect with a with a camera or a, any kind of uh, detector and then make into an image. What you can see that 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 uh, that orange donut is in fact the hot gas that's giving uh, uh, radiation, radio wave emission as it's getting swirled around this twisted black hole. It's not in the black hole, it's on the outside, but because a black hole can be so big and like spinning around, it spins up the gas quite a bit too. So even though the gas is not falling into the black hole or anything, you can still see this particular pattern of radio waves that comes out. But no, you cannot take a photo of a black hole. It's just, I mean, in, in the same sense that because nothing's coming away from a black hole, you can't actually image a black hole itself. So it would be like a profoundly black disk in space if you got up close to to one like a, a you know in the in the visualization there this is that visualization was by andrew andrew hamilton by the way i didn't make that um and it's amazing you know realistic uh uh simulation and visualization and so one i mean one thing you might imagine doing that i i think it's basically technologically impossible is if you were able to go directly to the event horizon of a black hole and hover you know like a few plonk lengths away from the event horizon itself with your special uh you know uh, camera that can take an image of the hawking radiation that's coming out and you were able to do that all around the the side of the black hole then you might be able to take a photo of a black hole otherwise no <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we can't take a photo of a black hole, but <laughs> thank you. For but we we can answer. again we can um, we can infer that they exist indirectly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. Okay. Um, do you have any more questions, Tanya? I don't have any more questions. I'm not sure if you're reading the live chat, but the audience is uh, yeah really enjoyed your talk. They thank you very much. Ah, no, I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, thank Glad you very much it. for your talk, James. Yeah. yeah, thanks for having me. It's it's a wonderful event. I look forward to maybe uh, having a, an event in person at some point in the future.